Welcome everybody to the May uh, 2022 Koha US Web Dev Day. So I've been working on sort of a grid display of covers for our front page. And I first did that with a third party um, library thing for libraries widget that we've used for a long time. And then I decided to try and break cover flow into a grid, which I have accomplished. Cool. Um, so let me find. I don't think that did what I wanted. Hold on. I just got off being at the front desk. So give me a minute to figure out where I am. Okay. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is actually using cover flow. And I I went into the cover flow settings and I just decided what if I didn't use carousel or flat or whatever the options are and I changed it to grid because I thought what will happen so it changed things up and then I really had to start playing with all kinds of other settings to make it not behave as a like as a carousel kind of stuff. So I basically turned all kinds of things off. And then like, I don't know how many seconds that is, but I made it not auto play because I didn't want it to. So that was the first thing I did. And so now it does look nice. And then I started playing with the CSS to try and, you know, spread it out and make it pleasing and, and all of that. And I, I've got that down. But the thing I think I'm struggling with is all the different screen sizes and devices. And I end up going down a trail of, well, I'll just make a media query for that because I sort of understand that. But I think I should probably be trying to use Bootstrap, which I don't completely understand. And right now I know that this looks good on a desktop. It looks good on an iPad landscape and portrait. It looks decent on some phones, but not all. And it looks terrible on a laptop at this moment. So I'm not sure what I need to do exactly. I feel like I end up creating tons of CSS, which is probably with media queries, which is probably not the thing to do. So I'm just wondering about advice and stuff like that. Let me go um, to my CSS so you can. Are you familiar with grid, the CSS property? I've used it a little. Okay. And a lot of this has been through, you know, inspecting the elements and turning things on and off. And it's like, ooh, that works. So <laughs> then I put that in the CSS. So I've got some, 
I think I'd started with grid things here, but I ended up with flex. Um, so anyway. So I'm just, I'm not looking at your CSS, but I'm, I'm inspecting your Bedford test homepage and I see grid, are you applying grid or does, does the cover flow apply grid because you told it to display grid? See if we can figure that out. Um, I, guess we I think can I tried it. flex once and I ended up staying with grid. So like I've gone so far down the CSS that I'm not sure if what's now in the plugin is driving things necessarily, or if I've just broken the cover flow plugin enough that it's not using anything except the fact that I can pull these covers from a report. Can you go, can you do me one favor and go back to your config and um, turn it back to grid? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm doing is, are you familiar with those like uh, um, the parameters we can add now to um, either OPAC or staff client that uh, disable sysprev OPAC CSS? Um, yes, I always have to look it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> me too. Um, um, I am looking at yours now with that on and I don't see grid being added. So I think that your CSS is adding grid, which is fine. Um, and grid has a lot of nice options um, for changing the number of rows, the number of columns, and, and how that all works um, in your CSS. So you can probably, as you screen size down, just do like some simple media, um, like media queries and um, change the number of columns, change the number of rows, stuff like that. Um, I think just grid, grid template rows and grid template columns are the two main ones. And I think there's a lot of parts of grid that I'm actually don't know anything about, but um, that might be your path forward, which is the non bootstrap way, I guess. Um, I don't see what's wrong with that though in this situation because you can't really apply bootstrap within your, like all the flipster things, unless you and put a bunch of JavaScript in there to add bootstrap classes. Mm -hmm. um, but grid, you can just apply it to an element and then start so doing like, it. So like, would that be like, these are the main things, would that be like here? Yeah, see that's displaying as flex. So like, yep, now see you have grid template columns, repeat. Um, and it's possible that nothing's really changed there because I've got so much else going on. I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, and I see that like, that, that error thing, it the, the X doesn't like something, but it, it also sometimes, that actually might be a fine property and this uh, editor just gets mad because it doesn't understand sort of some newer CSS stuff sometimes. Um, but I think that's where you want it. I guess if it were me, that's where I would be trying to mess around with that is by manipulating the grid. Okay. So then my next 
issue I think with this is these are the actual images. And I realized as I went on that with the with the third party um, widget, we were going to do like a main category of adult and teen and children's. And then in the adult category, we were going to break it down to, you know, fiction, mystery, nonfiction, home and garden, and do a, a you know, a show of covers for each of these different things. But in cover flow, in order to get those 24 covers to display, I've got to go through there and put in, you know, 24 of these. There's a way around that. And that's what I was hoping. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, basically like your class at a class, your classes are exactly the same except for the number, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let me see if I can just write a little like quasi CSS in the chat. So if I'm not going to write that all out, but it, say if it was like uh, Lipster item. Um, and that's a list, right? OK, so you can yeah. do. So you can do something like. trying to you can write a wild card for those numbers putting that in the zoom chat. So it's what that is saying is like, is if you have a list um, and the class, the, the, the carrot equals starts with, starts with flipster item future dash, that's all you have to put. And it's going to get <clears throat> everything that starts with that. So that will get every, if you have 500 of them, it will get them all. Cool. I realized, you know, it's like that's going to be a ton of <laughs> ton of stuff in there if I can't figure out how to shorten that somehow. So I will take a look at that later. And um, just if you look like uh, I'm just Google searching something like this. The caret is starts with, but there's you can use an asterisk, and that would be like a anywhere in it. Um, there's an ends with, and there's just some other wildcard stuff you can do in CSS. And that seems like what you need. Okay. Cool. And in your case, attribute would just be class because you're using those are all classes. Okay. Cool. Well, that's what I've been working on. And, and so I also had to change up the cover flow report a little bit um, because I wanted it to show, I wanted to show my most recent titles as they're cataloged and not do that really totally random display. I wanted it to have some predictability so I changed that up a little too, but um, it's it's starting to look like something. So 
Oh. I'll, I'll use those things and see what else I can uh, fix about it. It. Looks, it looks really awesome. I'm liking it. So I'm, I'm pleased that I got that far because I really didn't think I <laughs> would, but. Um, I, I would also say I, with your, in your cover flow config, you put your autoplay, you just set to a really big number. At this moment, that's what I did. And I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure you can just say autoplay false. False. Yeah. Okay. And I'll just check and make sure that actually has it deactivated. Cool. Thank you. I kind of wanted to watch it for 50,000 seconds to see what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. It could actually reach that number and then do something <laughs> awful. And then Cirque would come and say, Barbara, this is not working. And I don't remember if that's uh, seconds or milliseconds. So. Already this week, I fixed one thing on a self-registration form that wasn't working, broke something else, fixed that, and now they tell me that they can't submit the self-registration form. So now I <laughs> have to go look at that. You got to keep yourself busy. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, poking around. You might try this in your general template columns rule there. I found it on the CSS tricks page. Um, and I, I put it in the inspector and was playing on your site, and it seemed like it, that fixed it, like, but I'm not sure. You put it where? So that's uh, right under where you had to change it to grid in your CSS you had a grid template columns rule, right that one that was like aired out um so i put it there i swapped this in for that and i think it may have worked and if you all right if you're smart enough with grid and i'm 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 not um i think you can figure out a way to do all this without any css quick media queries um Right. Yeah. This one, this one specifically was no media query. So, and it's just six lines of code. They were flaunting that too. So worth a try. Okay. Cool. Um, what else do we have? What other projects are people working on? Or questions do you have? Things you want to learn? George must have something cool that he's working on. I was on vacation for over a week and I've been really busy and I haven't done a damn thing lately. <sighs> About the most interesting thing I've done is I've, I've been modifying notices. Um, so, and that hasn't really had a lot to do with anything. Mostly I've been, I got rid of, uh, I wrote a, some SQL to figure out which notices were exact duplicates of each other. And then I deleted like uh, 700, 800 notices that were all duplicates in our system. So, But that's not anything web development -y. That's just clean up from bad practices from the past. So, I've just been working on the display stuff, which I think I've showed off here before. but. I mean, I've got it on our live site now and several libraries are testing it. So I can show that off again if people want to see it. Okay. Sure. And will you be doing a presentation at Kohai Con for that? Uh, I haven't put in any proposals yet. Um, 
still figuring that out. So, yeah, I don't know. So, <laughs> this is my website. Um, so, this is the course reserves nav menu that I've swapped out for displays. And the up here, I swapped it out for displays. Basically, anything that said displays uh, or course reserves was changed to displays. You go into it. I didn't change the URLs. I did find some code that did that, but I, did, I figured it, that was too going too far. Um, but everywhere else, breadcrumbs, headings, all that says display, the buttons. I, the, what I mostly found with this was that um, it was, the course reserves module was too much. I, it was more than I possibly needed. Um, so I took away a lot of, I took away some of the buttons that pointed to some of the pages that I didn't need. Um, and basically we're just using the batch. So this is adding a new display. We're just using the batch remove items feature and the batch add items feature. I think there's a single single item add option too that um, does the same thing. So I tried to simplify it as much as possible. Um, and then of course there are lots of fields in the course reserves that we don't need like instructor and uh, if uh, students, I think there, there's a lot of things that um, I adapted. So the jQuery is extensive. <laughs> and like I said, it's mostly just relabeling. Uh, I do, since we are a consortium, I did go ahead and store the, the logged in library code and logged in branch, uh, branch name as variables so that I could leverage those in different places. Uh, mainly that's done here. So I, I'm using the branch code to filter it by library. So like if I switch to one of my other testing libraries, they're going to just see their displays. Uh, so I didn't want people accidentally clicking into each other's displays and messing things up. So I added that filter. Um, and then when you create a display, I've pre-filled the logged in library here. And I went through a lot of like trial and error trying to figure out what to make what. <laughs> so like what to use for um, which field in course reserves fit best with library. And that was mainly determined by um, where it displays. So I don't think there's any books in that one. There's lots of books in this one or items. So if I go over here, the, I wanted to make sure that what I was putting in those course reserve fields was showing up in this column because some do and some don't. Um, and you can kind of pick through the code and see the choices that were made um, and scroll through this. So this is just changing the menu link and the homepage link. Uh, the table header in uh, here, so not here here. So this changes the table header here. Um, and then I have like a pseudo permission set up so that uh, I can have people test it without everybody seeing it. And all that's doing is hiding the links to get to it unless the, um, the usernames are in this. So that, that won't be part of the final, final shebang. And then I just kind of went through each page and tried to relabel and redo things. So this is any anything that has course reserves in the URL, uh, changing titles, links, buttons, um, headings. And this, this is where you can see where I kind of picked my field. So um, department, I changed to type. Section, I changed to area of the library and term I changed to library because of where, where those three things display in the record. Uh, this is the code that limits that table by um, logged in branch. Oh, I also added a button here for a report. Uh, since we're using this a lot for new items, um, we want, I wanted to make sure there was a report that could be run to show how long something's been on a display so that they can go in and run the report and see 
oh, these have been on there more than a month. I need to, um, or more than six months or whatever the library uses as their standard. So they can run a list of those things, uh, go pull them and then batch remove them from the display. And um, another, like the greatest thing <laughs> about this, I think, is the fact that it it reverts the, it, it gives you temporary settings that then revert back. So um, right now, when they're managing these things, they're getting cataloged directly into the new location. And then when they take it off the new shelf, they go have to go into the cataloging side of things and put it in the final location. Um, but with this module, we can catalog it in its final resting place. And then all the, um, the CERC staff has to do is remove it from the display to get it back to that, um, which is great. It means uh, that we can, we don't have to give cataloging access to the front desk if they want to manage these sort of displays. Uh, I've also, we had a use case where um, the item type is different for new items. So I've got some libraries that circulate those for a shorter amount of time. And I've also got this whole new item sharing thing. So we had a lot of like things to test there, but it seems to all work pretty well uh, because the item, whenever you change one of these things, it becomes sort of like the thing <laughs> associated with the item. So if I change this to, to new shorter, um, that's its item type until it gets out of the display. And I transition new shorter to shorter automatically with the automatic items modification tool. And I wanted to make sure that still works because that's kind of what keeps our new sharing stuff in line, which it does. Um, so that's perfect uh, for our use case. The, let's see what else. So that added the report button. And then on the individual pages, there was a little more um, massaging, relabeling, uh, just anywhere it said uh, course, it was display. And then again, the section is area of the library, course number is library. Uh, I also do store the library code in there just to have it. It's it's the, for some reason on the OPAC, maybe in the staff client, that is hidden, but it's stored. So I thought it was nice to, to have that. I think it's that. Um, it's commented out for whatever reason. Um, so I don't know, maybe not necessary, but always nice to have extra things to grab onto. And then, like I said, instructors, we didn't need that. We're not using public notes for this. We're not using number of students. It does have an enable disable toggle, but that's not really necessary either in our, our use case. So I just kind of watered down what was there. Um, and there's a few places, like I said, where I removed some buttons and replaced it with the batch button because I thought that the batch was the most logical solution and just so it simplified it for staff. And but I did still make some of those relabeling modifications in the, the single item things in case somebody ever gets across to it. But for the most part, we're using batch add and batch remove. So that's it. There's some there's some wording that I had to change to that mentioned course reserves. So uh, when you're adding things, it says any existing course reserves, and I just made a different note there. Um, and I also, I limited to what shelving locations could be used. So we're only using it if we're temporarily moving into new or temporarily moving into display. Uh, so this line of code just removes everything else that's an option because we've got hundreds of shelf locations uh, just to try and reduce the amount of errors that might happen. And I do default it to new um, just for convenience sake. So when you go to add items, um, this is pre-checked and defaulted to new. Uh, you do have to check and then choose on the item type. But since it's only used in some cases, I didn't default anything there. And then, so that's all of the, the staff client. And then on the OPAC, um, let me find that. 
it's the same sort of deal. So it's showing, um, it's in the new DVDs and uh, Blu-rays at Iowa Public Library. It also shows if you put in the area of the library, if you fill in this field, it'll show that too. So you can direct the patrons to the area of the library. Um, it doesn't keep the, the permanent ongoing um, and temporary seasonal. This dropdown is just for internal tracking. Uh, so that doesn't display, it may display on the actual course or display display here. Yeah, so it, we do list it here, the type of display it is. Um, so for like seasonal displays, some reading displays, whatever random display they make topical, um, we call those temporary. And then for the, the new shelf is never going anywhere. So that's a permanent. So just so we have a, something to distinguish with and something we can use to run reports on. And that one is set up, that one was picked specifically because it is a authorized value already. Um, so there's some authorized value set up involved as well to, to use it. And yeah, so this is what it looks like on the, the patron side of things. Again, it just shows uh, all the same information. And if you back up a level, then you can see all the available displays. Uh, so patrons have a way to virtually access what's physically there. Um, another sort of great perk of this is we can set up a report uh, for these things and then feed that out to like the bookshelves plugin or whatever. Um, so they can have a a forever synchronized list on their website of what's on their new shelf, or if they want to set up like a virtual display next to their new shelf so that when things are checked out, people can still see a cycling list of what they've got um, available. So that's another bonus of having a displays module. Um, and the OPEX stuff is a lot less code. I mean, So I'm actually not sure what it's happening. So again, it's changing column headers on the item details page, just relabeling things um, in, on the various pages. And that's it. So it's it's a much shorter chunk of code because there's a lot less going on on the, on the OPEC side. So I think that's it. Um, oh, the other great thing about this is like, if they set up a temporary display, all they have to do is hit delete display when the display's over and it just, it fixes everything. Uh, it's a one button solution. They don't have to scan everything in. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot less clicks and a lot more convenience added to front desk staff on that. So we're, I've got three libraries testing it right now, and then we'll, we'll probably just open it up to anybody who wants to use it. The only other issue we ran into is um, we're still using prefixing. Uh, so like we've got some libraries that use short barcodes, and when you check it in, we have it prefix their organization code, which is not standard Koha, um, but it, that doesn't work in the course reserves module. So um, I have a ticket open on that. That's really the only real issue we've run into. Everything else has been pretty smooth and I've gotten some positive feedback so far. It looks yeah, really nice. <clears throat> I would really love to use it, but I got a library using course reserves, so. I think you can, I think it's doable. You I think it's doable too, it's just a lot of work. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think you just wrap that code in a, a thing that says if, branch code isn't the library using course reserves and make all the changes. I think the issue would be with the OPAC. Yeah, that's a little trickier. That's a little trickier because those people at Highland Community College tend not to, they're not logged in when they're using the OPAC. So I think that would be the, the tricky area. They use a, a separate, it's a separate URL though, right? No. No. No, we got everybody, we try to encourage everybody. The The whole idea is sharing. So we try to make sure everything's all one one location, so. Okay, then yeah, that maybe is tricky. 
maybe you could like scrape their IP addresses and their personal information and then <laughs> then designate their branch code based on that. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get right on that. So Jason, for the new items, are they physically marked in some way so that shelvers know to put them a certain place? Yeah, uh, typically those those things get a new sticker and then so there's some physical stuff going on with it um, as well and when they pull it off the shelf they take the new sticker off um, i don't know if every library does it that way that's just how we, we do it here yeah we're we are currently doing the changing of the location back to its normal you know location and removing the sticker i know um Marcy at McKinney worked on something to eliminate the new stickers completely. Um, and I'd have to revisit it, but I don't know. I think that might cause mutiny here. Yeah, you don't want to mess with people's stickers and their processing. That's dangerous <laughs> territory. <laughs> Maybe if you could come up with like a sticker that like fades over time. You know, like the ink di disappears after six months. <laughs> There's electronic stickers. Sure. Each sticker has a little battery powered uh, that sounds LED deep screen. And efficient. On <laughs> yeah, so that's mostly what I've been working on lately. Um, I'm looking at my various scraps of paper on my desk. I don't see anything else that's really exciting. Talked about permissions last month. I haven't really done anything else with that. I guess there is one thing that I, it's not anything that I've done recently. It's something that I did like in 2014 that I rewrite for each version of Koha is the, the two videos that Christopher and I did last Thursday and a week from today are on the circulation rules modifications. And I think everybody here has seen that, but I'm not sure, but I can. I'm not sure if I have. Yeah, you might not have. Uh, you can see Koha now, right? Yes. So I've got, this is, I originally did this when I was in Latah County and then I um, did a presentation on it at, uh, uh, the Coeur d'Alene conference, but uh, the videos that we're doing right now are how to add these, you know, collapsible columns in the circulation rules and uh, put a button over here to show it full width. And I've also got, uh, well, if you hover over a column, it highlights it to, uh, to make it easier to follow across the screen. And if you click on a column, it plugs it into the bottom row so that it's easier to edit. And I've got all the jQuery for that. I put it on the, the uh, uh, wiki at that address. So I know that um, I think uh, Bob has something similar uh, in Colorado. Yeah, that's um, it's a little it's a little bit different. I did that. Oh, okay. Um, for for click, it's a little bit different, but it's essentially the same idea with hiding columns and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so that's what last week's video from Koha US was about, and and it's big. It's enough jQuery that it's in two parts. So, I actually have three monitors. I have one, two, and three. And if you don't, if I if I don't. Um, have anything that makes this the table more compact it actually takes more than two full screens and so that's kind of my was my goal yeah this is what bob's looks like too yeah yeah same thing except instead of clicking where you click on the columns you kind of have them up here you just put a bunch of buttons up there yeah yeah lucas does your code also require you to like update it anytime a column gets added no that's one thing i I, I put those in as like, I get the index from the name of the column. So like if the column's called days mode, 
like find the column called days mode, get its index, and apply it that way. So that if columns change, but that I didn't do. Same. So I should look at I should steal that code. So I can if if you want, I'll send you that code, George, and you that'd can be awesome. Adapt it however you want, but that's just a little. It just helps when a column gets added and you don't have to go back in. And... Yeah, that's what I do every time there's a new version because there's almost always a column added every new version. It seems yeah, like. right. I think I right now I have a list of all the, all the possible columns so I can stick a new one in there whenever whenever one's added. So, but it's not really new, but it's something that I. Uh, Re, I uploaded the most current version of it to the wiki right before we did those two videos. So, when we started using that after you first showed it, George, and it's super helpful. And we're only one library, yeah. <laughs> and it's it's still useful to be able to get rid of stuff that you know you don't want to always see. And I have trouble with scrolling, and so. We also um, just it's really for my benefit because I'm really the only one that deals with with the circles with the circles. But I went ahead and made different sections that were like to me they felt like groups of things. Yeah, so I just added some colors so that as I was scrolling back and forth, it's like where's holds, and I'd be over here, and then I'd be back, and it's like oh yeah. So I just added a little color to help me. You know, figure out where I am on this big table. George, I sent you over my jQuery in Slack. Okay, cool. I'll check it out. I think my library with the most uh, circulation rules is Bonner Springs, and I think they have about 70. Well, at least 70 rows in the circulations column, so in the, in the rules column. And then I got 50 libraries, so I'm sure Jason has it pretty bad, too. Yeah, I don't like looking at that area. <laughs> <laughs> I did when I first started. We had a kind of a big clean out where we changed all the item types because they were like not great. They were like 14 D, D, 1 R, 7 dollar sign or whatever. I don't know what they were, uh, but they were they were like coded so that it, it was had the cert time coded into it. Um, so we brought that back down into just like books, you know, a book circulates this way at this library and a book circulates this way at this library. So I had to go through and like redo them all at that point. But over time, they've magically expanded even though i thought i was the only one really managing them um some of my libraries still have some pretty bloated rules tables so yeah i at the beginning of the pandemic when uh things needed to circulate for different times we needed to to stop shipping things through the courier um i had a lot of problems managing it because there were so many so many rules that could have been all items, all categories that there had been specific rules written that duplicated the existing rules. Like there were, you know, in one library would have separate rules that were identical for each patron category. And yeah. so I had to do a lot of that cleanup. And I'm I, sure that that was, I'm sure that that was left over from like 2008, 2009 when Knuckles was new with Koha and they didn't know that there would be a, uh, you know, a consequence to that, you know, 20 years later, 10 years later. So. Would it be helpful if you could import and then export those circles? Oh, that'd be awesome to like export them into a CSV and, yeah, and then edit them and yeah, and then import them, or if you were, you could save a copy off if you were messing with your circles and then re go back to where yeah. you were. <laughs> I, um, one of the first things that I, one of the things that I encountered, not at this job, because I'm the only one that has access to the circles, but when I was at Valnet, and there's like four different people that had access to the circles, and invariably, 
somebody would call and they say, I accidentally cloned all my rules to another library. How do I get the old ones back? That would certainly help with that problem. <laughs> that only happened once at my, my <laughs> consortium before that button disappeared forever. So <laughs> um, I want that for the transfer cost matrix too. Can we, can we do that there too? That's the worst thing to edit in the history of things to edit. If we could export it and then re-import it with changed values. Mm -hmm. The the circles are a little easier because you can, it's a regular table. I I forgot <laughs> how like this the cost transport matrix is it just sucks. You have to like anything. click the box and then uncheck the box and then type in it for every single box. And it's better now. Before there was a bug with it where like if the library was closed that day and you made a change on another library, then it would permanently close the library that was closed on that day. <laughs> um, and that bug got fixed. But I still have to, I mean, whenever I'm turning people on and off in there, it's 50 plus, well, double that because you have to do the, the row and the column um, clicks just to activate the box. It's the um, number of libraries squared is the number of possible entries you can have. Yeah. So typically I don't do anything with that. I mean, it would be handy if I could zero those out when the library is closed, but typically I just hide all their items in the OPAC and turn off their, their ability to place hold. Um, but that, yeah, that's another thing that I would love to see is more fleshed out is the closing libraries. Like if there was a central place where we could change the settings for a library. Um, I think we've talked about it, that at the consortium of SIG before, but it's, I always forget to do something. I either forget to unhide their stuff in the OPAC and then a month later they're like, why can't my people see my items? Um, or I, I forget to turn their holds back on. That one's usually figured out faster because they need their holds. Um, but it's like seven different places we're making changes when somebody needs to shut down, which it, it wasn't a big deal before COVID, but now it seems like it's happening every other week and not COVID related. Like I've got, I have a library that's currently closed because they box up all their books to move across the street. And then I've got, I had two libraries that had mold problems so bad that they've been shut down for several months. Um, so we still have that need even when it's not pandemic related. I'm on, I'm on a on a tangent and a rant, so I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't have it on on uh, the Neckles Koha, but I did write some jQuery when I was at Valnet and we actually used the circulation transportation cost matrix to uh, click on a row and have it move to the top. Um, like with my circulation rule stuff so that that way it would be right there and you didn't have to scroll up and down to see you know which column you were in um and i had another one that you would uh that would add a button that would unlock all of the all of the input boxes in a row if you clicked on the the input box and i think i tried like that. that one and i something blew up and i never went back <laughs> like it would just spin indefinitely um I, i've also got like for my transfer cost matrix there's maybe like five varieties of libraries like they usually share the the cost values between the different libraries yeah so i could i have thought about setting it up so i could pre-fill a row with like the whatever category they're in like one through five or whatever so I, yeah there are ways i could make it better but I, I that's the way i did it at valnet i had like there were multiple different ways that the row essentially there were like five different possible sets of values across a whole row and so i just had a button that would that would unlock a row that would for, first i'd move it to the top and then i would unlock all the boxes and then it would uh, populate one of five sets of values into there so but i don't have any of that code on my system now because we're not using the transportation cost matrix here so I will say I've been bashing it, but it is great for us because we it gives us a lot more control over how the holds flow. Um, so we were able, since we're different than Neckles, we have a collection that's housed in the, the public library yeah. up front. 
So we always want the, the holes to go to us first. So the, the cost matrix lets it lets that happen. Um, and we can kind of direct the flow to the larger libraries and reduce the burden on the smaller libraries with it. So um, as much pain it causes to edit, it's definitely uh, um, been worthwhile for us. And, and, you know, I would say it made a huge difference in Valnet because there the courier was a lot more complicated than it is here. Um, there were different loops and uh, different yeah. ways that, you know, I, I had it worked out to where there were different values based on um, where you were in the, in the loop and which loop you were on and whether things were going from one loop to another loop or, you know, some some items had to cross five different loops of, of drivers so yeah um, it, it worked really well it's not um, that complex but i do factor all that stuff in because i've got like we we're, we've got four <coughs> different courier routes going in our area um and then i factor in how many days are open and how many days a week they get courier so mm -hmm. all of that plays in so that things can get to the patrons faster that's the ultimate goal yeah But that table is, you know, huge. It's a monster. The circ one or the trans the transportation one. Yeah. Well, both of them really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, any. I, I think that the requires three screen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've never tried blowing the to see how how many screens it takes to display the entire transportation cost matrix on it. I'm gonna try that right now. Need a 50 inch monitor. It looks like it takes about two and a half screens. So it's it's bigger than the, the circulation rules. Circulation took about two and a third. All right, we're rounding out the Jason soapbox hour. What else? <laughs> <laughs> what else do you guys want to talk about? You unmuted Barbara, I saw it. Um, I'm <laughs> putting the link for uh, Koha Khan in the chat it's september 20th through 23rd in lawrence kansas and uh this will take you to the link on the koha us uh, website and there is a link for proposals so um think about something you could uh present and i think uh we're taking a proposal entries through june 3rd i believe i don't know if i'm gonna make it it's a long drive isn't it george <laughs> so uh hannah is here from salina yeah are, is are you guys planning on sending people to the koha conference from from central i may come myself we are still trying to figure out some of the logistics but i'm hoping i'll be able to join for at least a day or two. I'm excited. It'll be my first, so I'm ready for it. Well, it's pretty close. You guys should all come. Just close up all the libraries for the day. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could. <laughs> Ooh, we should get Hannah to come to our Kager too. I noticed not very many people have responded to the oh, Kager shit. email. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you, are, is, Hannah, do you know about keggers? This is Kansas stuff, sorry. <laughs> no, I have no clue. I'm still trying to get all involved in library things here in Kansas, so. So we do have a Koha Explorers group, that's the keg. Um, they're generally non-alcoholic, unfortunately. Um, but we try to have those twice a year, which and they're just the Kansas users group. Uh, usually mm -hmm. we have one this time of year and then one at kla so yeah and i, I sent out that. a i sent out a doodle poll and i looked at it and then i went on vacation for a week and i didn't get an invite sent i'll have to look at that doodle poll and see if we've gone past any of the dates yet we may have 
some of them are next week, I think. It'll be all online. There is, Hannah, there is a mailing list um, just for Kansas Koha users. Oh, okay. Um, if you send me an email at george at neckles.org, I can add you to that mailing list. Will do. Okay. Cool. So we've got about three minutes. Any any final thoughts, closing closing statements? <laughs> <laughs> Closing cricket. I got nothing to say. Can anybody make that? I, I once met a dude that could make the cricket chirping noise with like the his back two teeth. And I was so jealous he never taught me how to do that. Um that was at band camp. Uh, <laughs> all right, so it is currently May, so our June meeting will happen on third Thursday, June 16th, same time. Okay. Thanks, everybody, and see, all see then. you then. Have a good month, if not sooner. <laughs>